we can go ahead and get started. Um, as you probably heard a notification that we are recording this meeting, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're going to record the meeting and pass out or hand out or send a link to the recording and the slide deck after uh, the meeting. So uh, those who join late or those who uh, were unable to join uh, will still be able to uh, view the content that we're going to review today. So again, my name is Craig Harry. I'm a senior project manager at Unicon, and I work on the SSP program uh, and work with uh, all of the development projects and implementations around SSP. I have with me in the room uh, Paul Spody, who is the tech lead on SSP, the primary uh, open source support uh, person that uh, um, our open source support customers work with. And I also have Mike Sulzberger, who is a fellow developer on the SSP project. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, just as a reminder, uh, the, the uh, meeting is being recorded. All right, uh, so we'll get started. Our agenda for today uh, is pretty straightforward and typical for these type of meetings. Uh, I'll give you a community update, so um, a little bit about what's going on with SSP in general, a sustaining engineering update. Uh, we'll talk about some plans that we have for the 2.9 release. Uh, we'll go over some um, 2.8 release highlights, uh, and then Paul Spody is going to take over the second half of the meeting and go into detail on uh, many of the features or a few of the high-level features um, in detail that uh, are included in the 2.8 release. And then, as I mentioned at the end, we'll have a Q&A period. Please feel free to, um, as I mentioned earlier, add any questions that you have in the chat window, and we'll cover all of those at the end. So as far as the community update, so just a reminder, uh, this is about a year old, but as a reminder, uh, the SSP platform repository has been separated from uPortal. It's now in a separate repo effective with the 2.7 release. So um, implementers who are looking to go out and get 2.8 uh, should use the new uh, GitHub URL um, supplied here. Uh, to get the SSP platform. Uh, there's also a link to the wiki, the JSIC uh, Aperio wiki, uh, for information about uh, this repo separation. Okay, uh, as always, some helpful links that we always like to uh, pass out. So the homepage for the uh, JSIC or Aperio wiki. Uh, we use JIRA for all of our issue management. Uh, those unfamiliar with JIRA, it's a ticketing system um, that is used to track uh, feature requests and bugs. Uh, so you can go in there and it's open to the public. You can go see what we're working on, what we have tabbed, um, what tickets have been completed, uh, tickets that are in progress, uh, a lot of different information that you can uh, retrieve on what's going on out of JIRA. Uh, we've got installation notes and documentation link as well. Um, that covers uh, every SSP release. And then we've got uh, the Aperio email list, which is helpful for um, keeping in contact with other SSP implementers and users um, in a global email list. Moving on, what version should I be running? So we just released the 2.8 version actually about four months ago. Uh, so as far as releases, we've now jumped from um, the earliest recommended release being 2.4 up to the 2.6.1 release, um, and that is primarily uh, due to security and um, ease of upgrades. Um, any future upgrade, there really isn't any reason that we can think of why someone shouldn't upgrade all the way to 2.8. And we've already had a lot of uh, implementers already do that. Um, 2.8 includes about 40 uh, bug fixes and over 20 improvements and new features since 2.7. We'll go through um, 
those on a high level and in detail later on in this meeting. Um, any future feature ads um, are going to only be done to 2.8. Uh, we don't have plans to backport any new features um, to 2.7 or earlier, um, only if uh, there are security patches uh, required. That's the only reason we would go back and touch anything earlier than 2.8 at this point. Okay, sustaining engineering updates. So for those of you who aren't familiar with what sustaining engineering is, um, as part of Unicon's open source support program, uh, Unicon donates a total of four hours per month per client or per subscriber. So a total of 48 hours of a year per subscriber is um, used as a, a development time that we dedicate to the particular program. So in this case, SSP. So currently we're accruing about 33 hours a month. Um, we have about 300 hours planned at this point to be dedicated to the 2.9 release. We will be working uh, most of those hours during the summer and fall as uh, our time with other projects and priorities allow, but uh, we're planning to dedicate about 300 hours to the 2.9 release. We dedicated about a total of 250 hours to the 2.8 release. Um, and for the 2.8 release, those uh, hours were dedicated to um, new features on top of what current implementers um, contracted with Unicon to do, which was uh, quite a bit actually for the 2.8 release. We did a lot of um, uh, usability and UI improvements, uh, specifically around accessibility with that time. We improved the security um, with uh, Java 8 and Tomcat 8 support now. Uh, I mentioned accessibility was a big, big use of those hours as well, as along with the, uh, a lot of the bug fixes um, that we were able to do. So a uh, quick overview of the 2.9 roadmap. So this doesn't look like a lot, only three bullets, but it actually is uh, quite a bit of work. Uh, so finish up the accessibility work. So what we did is um, we dedicated about 70 to 80 hours um, that wasn't already included in that sustaining engineering uh, to do an accessibility review of SSP. And um, from that report, we use the sustaining engineering hours or, or some of those sustaining engineering hours to address uh, what we call the low-hanging fruit. So the um, easy UI fixes of which there were dozens. Um, so we completed all of those. What's left on accessibility really is around the EXTJS upgrade. Um, and some other things which um, are a uh, uh, fairly hefty amount of hours. So um, you can see in JIRA SSP 3200 to 3210 covers what the plans are around um, accessibility in order to get to that 508 compliance. The notification panel, which is in SSP 2907, uh, that is um, a notification suite within SSP that we have um, planned for quite some time and we've done a little bit of work on thus far but nothing at this point um, can be actually put into the application so we plan to use a fair number of um, sustaining engineering hours toward that. What that's going to do is kind of create a dashboard of notifications for an advisor uh, so that they don't have to rely um, exclusively on their email and they can just simply see various notifications within uh, the SS SSP UI. Uh, and again, SSP 2907 uh, in JIRA uh, describes that in a little more detail. And then enhance the message queue for corrective action. Uh, that's probably the, the low um, item um, and probably won't get uh, worked on um, unless we either get an infusion of sustaining engineering hours or um, uh, some school comes in and sponsors that work. And you can see that at SSP 3180 with all the details. So that's a high level roadmap 
of course, uh, most of what goes into a version um, comes from you. Uh, it comes from schools who need a feature um, or a, an improvement or a bug fix. And then, of course, uh, we do that under contract with the school. And then that work is donated back for the benefit of the entire community. So I'm going to give you uh, just a quick bullet pointed list of 2.8 highlights and then Paul's going to jump in and go into detail. So the 2.8 released uh, was released January 17th. That was a little bit later uh, than we had planned or hoped. We were hoping to get it out in November of last year, uh, but we had um, really a, a landslide of schools coming to us in late summer and in the fall uh, wanting um, contracted work and so we thought rather than doing a separate release um, and because during the holidays uh, there's usually not a lot of clamoring for that type of stuff uh, we postponed it and so everything that was completed um, in late 2016 as far as contracted work and sustaining engineering is included in this release uh, we've got a link there for the release notes. Again, this is all on the JSIG uh, Aperio wiki. And then the 2.8 data integration mapping as well. That's been updated because uh, we are, um, we did add some tables to the SSP database. Uh, so I won't go through each of these. I mentioned the Java 8 and the Tomcat 8 uh, security support. Um, Bulk add external students and assign or reassign coaches from a CSV file is a very um, often requested feature, and that is now um, in place. Uh, special service groups can be synced from the SIS and found in search. Um, a lot of schools have found interest or have shown interest in that. Um, the map now shows electives, so you can choose from within the map tool uh, if a if a course has various electives that can be substituted, that can be done right from it within the map interface now. Um, map template creation can now be, there's now a separate tool to perform that function. So a lot of schools use an admin or an intern or somebody to create the map templates. Uh, that is now a separate function, so you don't have to supply that resource with uh, special permissions. Um, and they don't have to be logged in as a specific person in order to uh, create map templates. Um, some other features, so uh, configurable success indicator search. Uh, so you can now identify at-risk students um, in search, either in external data or within your caseload. Um, we've got some customizations for faculty emailing. Uh, so as not to bombard them with emails on early alert responses. Um, the nightly database sync with the, between the SSP database and the student information system has been vastly improved. I mentioned the accessibility improvements before. Um, and then some additional items. So I mentioned earlier 40 plus bug fixes. Um, and then we've got some reports. Um, that were either miscalculating uh, totals or there were some labels within the reports that weren't clear. Uh, so those labels were changed in order to clarify uh, what that result is. Um, and then last but not least, the map plan status calculation now considers retaken courses, which is, uh, was asked for uh, by a couple schools. That covers the overview. I'm going to now turn it over to Paul uh, to go into some of the key features within 2.8 that uh, most schools will find valuable. All right, so the bulk add uh, and the reassign uh, feature um, is, is a particularly useful feature. Currently, uh, the way things work, you can change a student's coach assignment um, individually. You can add a student individually. Um, you can even bulk reassign students, but you have to know, uh, you know, you have to go find the coach, select the student, transfer them to the, the, the next coach in the UI. Um, so it requires you to, to, to know all that information. Um, and there was a request by, by 
the school to say, I have a CSV of these students, a list of these students that I want to reassign, or I have a list of these students that I want to add that are in SSP external data. And so this feature addresses that functionality. And all it simply is, is if you have a CSV file format or you create one with the student school ID, um, a coach school ID, and even a requesting school school ID. So the, the requester school ID will actually say who made the change. Um, so I can put down, you know, my own info or someone else's if it's if it's a different information. And then when that CSV is uploaded, um, you can see the screen there in the admin view on, on the right. Um, SSP examines that and sees the change in that's been uploaded and makes a change in the background. Um, there's an email confirmation upon completion, and any student that can be re reassigned or added to SSP, that action will be taken. Um, and students, obviously, that can't or that there was an issue, say a school ID was mistyped, uh, they won't have that action taken upon them. Um, it's pretty simple at this point. It just allows to, you to reassign existing students to different coaches, or it allows you to add external only students. Uh, but in the future, uh, this feature can be extended, um, particularly for any, any need that a school would want. Um, there's, there's a couple other reasons. Um, uh, you know, one that comes to mind is perhaps program status, bulk changing program status um, for graduation or the like. Excellent. So the next feature is um, service groups. And as Craig mentioned, they are now able to sync service groups from the SIS. So what that means is there's a new external table for uh, special service groups. And there's a code value to sync that with internally created special service groups. Um, and for if you add a student from external data, um, or if certain options are selected in the configuration, uh, basically student, that data will be pulled from the external table and updated into internal records. Um, so there's less work on advisors, you know, if the school has that information in their SIS. Um, and it also allows, in this case, as you see on the right, to be able to search that data. Um, so a, a main example is you have a, a special service group and you know th that they need a, you, they're in external data, they haven't been added to SSP, you can search those records and find them easily and then add them to SSP if they need to be added. Um, basically th there's a nightly sync process and there's, there's, there's two options in that nightly sync process. Um, as I mentioned, one configuration option would be to just sync the special service groups and make sure they match. Um, another option is to actually add external students if they have a special service group that matches. Um, and, and they get added um, based on their need of the special service group. So there's a new report, um, a special service course report. And what this report does is um, reports on the special service groups, uh, whatever one you want to select, and then it lists their current transcript with the grades that you have specified. So you can see there's a D plus, D, D, minus, and F, um, and they have it drawn, so they have a W and a WF as a status, and that report will show all the students in that special service group who have withdrawn, withdrawn failing, um, or have a, a poor grade um, as listed there. And then that ties in with the uh, next feature, uh, which is the email notification to the advisor. Um, so what this feature does is it works with just what I described, that report and also the syncing from external data. And what it does is if on a special service group you select, I want to notify the advisor if a student withdraws, it's a new configuration option. If that option is selected, then the advisor will get an email notification when the student withdraws. And as you can see on the right there, that's a new message template. It can be altered or, or changed or themed for your institution. Um, an advisor will receive a single email. They will not receive multiple emails. It's a single email that shows all students in their casebook for that special service group uh, that has to withdrawn or match any other criteria based on the course status code, um, as you saw in that previous report. The next feature is the map template tool. And as Craig mentioned, this, this is a new tool. We've broken out the templates from the map plan tool uh, to kind of provide some differentiation. Uh, 
you can also access this tool without selecting a student. So that's the other big feature is, um, as Craig mentioned, you have an administrator or maybe an intern, you give them like a support staff role, and you give them just access to the template tool, they won't be able to see actual map plans for a student. Um, the permissions are locked down in that way. But they can still create the templates the, the, based on the course catalog and the other items that your institution needs to create. And so this is a way, it's also separated into a new tool and then MinView as well. The template's kind of separated in there, which we'll get into a little bit later. Um, by default, though, uh, there's a configuration option and it's turned off. So that basically, by default, this template tool and the map tool show up, and, they, and the map tool kind of works the same as, you, as you're used to. And this is so that institutions that upgrade that don't want this new separation uh, can still work with SSP and enjoy SSP as, as they uh, have before. But if you want to have total separation between creating template and then it's working with plans, and you can still load a plan from a template in the map view, um, you can set the configuration option different. And if you need any more information on that, please reach out to us. We can get you those configuration options. Um, again, we hope this tool um, you know, helps out with the kind of differentiation between map and templates. In the past, there's been a lot of confusion with have I been, you know, am I editing a template or am I editing a student's plan? And, and it leads to confusion and, and issues there. So the other new feature uh, mentioned was the course electives. So these are template course electives and they relate to a template. So before in MAP, um, you could have electives, but it was applied to a course after the plan was created and the course was added. And you, it was kind of broad. You say the elective was, um, was honor or, um, honors. So you, you click a drop down, it had a color, and you click honors on it. And, and that's still there, and, and those, are, those work for broad. So that works when you actually just assign the course. But what happens if there's multiple courses that could be selected? And what happens when I'm creating a course catalog, uh, you know, using a template to create a course and a, and a catalog, and I want to want the advisor to be able to be able to pick, say, three courses for, for an elective. Well, this is the feature that allows you to do that. As you can see in the drop-down there, you know, there's a little icon, you click the drop-down, and you can select one, one of those three courses there, and, or actually that one is only two. Um, and then that way, on the, and this is on the plan view, uh, that way, uh, you know, if the student needs to take AES 118 for any reason, um, that can be uh, provided. Um, th this is pretty easy. Um, there's a couple things to remember with this. It, it, it's based on templates. So the template has to be created first. Then you go to the admin screen, and you can actually set up all the electives for the saved courses in the templates. Um, so that, that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, and, and permissions can be given separately for that if, if there needs to be an intern or other things working with that. Um, the list of elective options will, for each course will be available when printing or emailing uh, a plan. Um, and the map plan status calculation is now updated to honor these electives. So whether I have CSC 101 or AES 118, whether e, no matter which, if I took one of those and passed, I'll still be passing on the map plan status calculation. And if I fail one of those courses, I'll, I'll fail the calculation. So as I kind of briefly mentioned before, there's this new admin template management stuff. And we kind of broke out some of the older template stuff, which was status. You could, you could disable templates from the admin screen. Um, and, and we kind of add this course elective stuff into there. So as you see on the bottom part of that screenshot there, that's the new course electives view. And what that is, is you would go into the, the view at the top there, select a template, click edit with elective courses, and then you see a list, a tree view there of all the courses on the current template. And then you just drag the electives over, you get a green icon, and then you, you can see it's added. You can delete, et cetera. And once that's done, it's saved, it's in there, and then creating any plan off that template, you'll see the drop down, you know, visible, the icon and the drop down visible uh, for a student when you create a plan from that template. So the next feature is uh, one that wasn't mentioned previously was a participation score. Um, so what this is a new external data column in the transcript course information for a student. And what this is, it, it can be any value. It doesn't have to be a percentage. It doesn't have to be numeric. 
Um, although, you know, some schools have, uh, you know, they keep it numeric. Like in this case, it's, it's values of 100 relating to percent. Um, but what it's designed to do is show a course participation. So whether it means attendance or other metrics, um, the school can define that. And basically, it, it lists, you know, out of a value you define, um, has a student met that participation goal for that course? If they've met it a certain range, great, you're green. If not, you're yellow and, and you know, et cetera, red, just like the success indicators that display on the screen. And in fact, it uses that configuration to make that, that goal. Um, if you did not want those colors to show up, you don't have to have the colors show up. You can disable that. Um, you can also rename the column and change it to, to other data types if you'd like as well. Um, so that leads into, you have these colors here, it leads into this participation indicator. So the participation indicator is a special indicator. Um, as I mentioned, you can customize it for those ranges we discussed, whether string or numeric, um, but it takes the worst value out of that list of the schedule tab. So the, the schedule tab shows the current courses of, in the current term, and it takes the worst value. So in this case, the student has it in 87, so that was the worst value but it's still acceptable, so he's in the good range and you see the green uh, listed there. Um, but it shows you, it's not a sum, it's not an average, it shows you the worst value. Um, that cannot be changed, uh, but you can turn off the whole the particip participation indicator itself if that does not meet you know, the institution requirements. So with that feature, um, some schools' participation is probably the most important metric that they use. Maybe others, it's GPA. Um, whatever it may be, uh, there's this new caseload risk count feature. And what this does, it shows the poor and okay risks in the search view when you search for students or you view your caseload, et cetera. And what that does is say participation and GPA, uh, for example, were the indicators that my institution most cared about. So an admin would select showing caseloads, um, showing caseload view. So those those would be calculated in that risk view there. And say uh, if for one student, if they were both poor, you would see a two zero. If they were, if one was poor, one was medium or okay, you'd see a one one you no know, kind of split there. Um, but it's a way for looking through the uh, students at a glance that you can see um, indicators that matter. Uh, which, who is, is, is the one I have to take, you know, the, the most of a look at, who do I have to prioritize, um, you know, and who would I have to kind of, you know, uh, say, you know, I need more to spend more time with this student, um, or et cetera. Um, you won't get any notification based on these lists. That's actually a separate feature I'll talk about in, in, a, in a little bit. So there's another option that ties in with this, and that's generate an early alert. So you see showing caseload there, and that compiles with that, um, that metric we just saw. But uh, the generate early alert on low means if it goes to red, or the low value range, uh, which can be customized for, for all indicators, um, an early alert will be generated. So this is a way, say, participation was added. And that's a value that matters a lot for reporting. And if they go low on, on any course you know, in that participation, Obviously, the indicator goes red, but say a coach didn't see it, you know, right away. You know, it could take a long time for him or her to, to take action on it. This is a way to, for a coach to know immediately uh, when, when something meaningful has happened. And you can select this for all indicators. Um, it, it's, it's completely customizable uh, for each indicator. At this point, we're asking for questions. So... Uh, Paste them in the chat, and we'll we'll answer them to the best of our ability. So there anyone have any questions? I've unmuted everybody, so in case those who are just on the phone um, and don't aren't online uh, have questions, you can go ahead and just ask them here.
Okay, we'll wait about maybe 30 more seconds. If there are any questions, go ahead and just uh, ask them verbally or you can type them into the chat as well. And if there are no questions, then we'll go ahead and end the meeting. Will the presentation be available for download? Yes, I will send out a link to the recording and the presentation uh, later on today. Thanks. Yep. Okay, well, it looks like uh, that was the only question. So uh, we thank you for your time today and your participation and your use of SSP. And uh, as always, if you have uh, questions, concerns, uh, need support or anything else, um, you can reach out to us in a number of different ways. Uh, I know everybody's got my phone number and email address, um, as well as Paul's uh, support ticket um, as well for support issues, and uh, we would be happy to help you. So thanks for your time and your participation in this meeting. Bye.